Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2015-2016 Imprint Margaret Root Brown Reading Series. My name is Rich Levy. I'm Executive Director of Imprint, and we are so glad you're here tonight, both in the theater and online, for an evening with Anthony Doerr. Since 1980, this series has presented nearly 350 writers from 28 countries, including winners of eight Nobel Prizes, 60 Pulitzer Prizes, 55 National Book Awards, which helps to feed our love of great books and the people who write them. We have a terrific community of readers and writers, and I thank you for being a part of it. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome to Houston and to the Imprint Brown Reading Series the brilliant and beloved fiction writer, Anthony Doerr, whose novel, All the Light We Cannot See, received the 2015 Pulitzer Prize and from its perch on the New York Times bestseller list for nearly two years, introduced Tony's work to a fantastic number of people. Next month, the series will continue on February 29th with a visit from Tracy K. Smith, the Pulitzer Prize winning poet, who will be reading from her National Book Award nominated memoir, Ordinary Light. There's a lot of light in this series at Rice University's Studi Concert Hall. Individual tickets for this reading go on sale tomorrow at noon. In March, we welcome fiction writers Matt Johnson and Helen Oyeyemi. In April, poets Tony Hoagland and Sharon Olds. We hope you'll be with us all spring. Details and more are at imprinthouston.org. Uh, please join the Imprint Book Club on Sunday, February 14th, 4 p.m., a little Valentine's Day treat at Imprint House to discuss all the light we cannot see. Our website has the details. Also, please visit the Imprint blog and open book. You can join our email list, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Houston writer Matthew Celesis is live tweeting for us tonight at Imprint Houston. We invite you to join the conversation. We present the Imprint Margaret Root Brown Reading Series in Houston, Texas, in association with Brazos Bookstore and the University of Houston Creative Writing Program. This series is made possible by the extraordinary support of the Brown Foundation and is named for founding trustee Margaret Root Brown. The series is also underwritten by Weatherford International and the National Endowment for the Arts, which affirms that art works. Special thanks tonight to our live stream partner, Houston Public Media, and especially arts and culture director, Sinjin Flynn, and producer, Todd Hulslander. Imprint also receives support from the city of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance and the state of Texas from the Texas Commission on the Arts. Last but not least, we owe endless thanks to our season ticket holders who helped to make this series possible and accessible to the entire community. Wel welcome again to those watching the live stream of this program. Now tonight, Tony Dorr will read his short story, The Deep, which won the Sunday Times EFG Short Story Award in the UK. It's the largest prize in the world for a single short story and appeared only in the paperback edition of the 2010 story collection, Memory Wall. After his reading, Tony will have a conversation here on stage with fiction writer Robert Kremens, who teaches at the UH Honors College about, among other things, all the light we cannot see, to be followed by a few minutes of Q&A with you. So, if you have a question for Mr. Doerr, please join us at the end of the Q&A. There are microphones at the ends of the aisle here, um, and we just ask that you be respectful and concise. Uh, then we'll have a book sale and signing upstairs in the Grand Foyer. Thanks to Brazos Bookstore, our fine independent bookseller, offering discounts on books tonight and all season by authors in the series. They have signed copies of All the Light We Cannot See, available for purchase. Now please, if you would set your cell phones on stun or silent mode, thank you. No flash photos or taping, except for those authorized to do so. 
You have a perfectly fine brief bio of Anthony Doerr in your program, which I hope you have enjoyed, and I'll just add a few details. Tony was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, where he says, quote, to call yourself a writer would be precocious or pretentious, unquote. He grew up in a house filled with books, quote, on the toilet tanks, inside kitchen cabinets, even on dad's workbench in the basement. On Wednesday nights, he says, my brothers and I were allowed to bring books to the dinner table and read while we ate. As a parent, I wish I'd thought of that. It's a pretty good idea. He started a daily journal as an assignment in 10th grade and has kept one ever since. Now, when asked by the New York Times about his favorite novelists, he names, quote, W.G. Sebald, probably, or Virginia Woolf, or Melville, great writer, says Dorr, probably shouldn't be ranked, at least not by me. He says he'll read anything by Ann Carson, J.M. Coetzee, Cormac McCarthy. What books might we be surprised to find on his shelves? The complete four-volume box set of Calvin and Hobbes. <laughs> for several years, Dorr wrote a column on science for the Boston Globe. And as you might know from his memoir, Four Seasons in Rome, which if you haven't read, you must read, Dorr is fond of the writings of Roman antiquity. He says, quote, if Lucretius or Pliny the Elder or Livy were transported to 2015, and set up comfortably in an apartment in, I don't know, Tampa, and given a year to write a book about contemporary America, I'd be the very first in line to read it. I'd like to read Herodotus on Obamacare, <laughs> Pliny on the Dorito. <laughs> me too. Please join me in giving a warm Houston welcome to a writer whose work enchants us informs us, intrigues us, and leaves us wanting more. Anthony Doerr. That's so nice, Rich. It's nice you guys to clap and to come out on a Monday night. This is amazing. So kind of you. I had so much fun in Houston today. First of all, it felt like it was 95 degrees to me, which was <laughs> the greatest thing. And everybody has been so kind. I've met so many different kinds of people here. And Rich just told me this is the most diverse city now in the United States. It's incredible. It's definitely worth the clap. I'm just thrilled to have been turned on a little bit. Plus, the creative writing department here, which is very famous and uh, well-respected, you know, there's so much happening and they're all integrated within print. There's so many lessons for other communities and the ways that the community and universities and the bookstore can all work together. And it's great that you guys are here and it's great that you guys have been supporting Brazos Bookshop for so long, over 30 years it sounds like. Indies and literary organizations and the university all working together with the community, it seems like paradise to me. Uh, so they asked me to give a reading instead of a talk. Usually I show a bunch of slides of bombers and World War II, so this is going to be fun for me. I haven't done a reading in a long time, and I'm going to read you a short story, if that sounds all right. And I cut maybe, all right, I love it. I'm already getting claps. And I cut maybe four minutes out of it. So those of you who've read the story, you might miss a few sentences here and there, but I tried to keep it around 35 minutes. And then I'll hopefully have a fun conversation with Robert and then take some questions from you guys. Sound good? Okay, like uh, many, there are some amazing writers in here. Uh, like many of you probably know, lots of different things get crammed into the stew of your mind. So sitting in the hotel room, uh, trying to think about what was in the stew when I wrote this story called The Deep. And I came up with four things. Uh, the first was I was reading about whale falls. Does anybody know what a whale fall is? Anybody in here? Okay, great. That's good. Um, we didn't even know what they were until the late 70s and the development of submersibles, deep, deep sea submersibles. Whale falls are, uh, especially along migration routes, if a whale dies, uh, often they float, but lots of times they sink. 
and their carcasses are incredible nutritional bounties. All these lipids go sinking down d deep water. We're talking like between six and 10,000 feet. And they create these huge ecological communities in deep, dark, freezing cold ocean water that can last for up to 100 years. There's all kinds of uh, species that we're still just now discovering. We discover a new deep sea species on average every two weeks. So you can tell that to your kids when they say, there's no mystery left in the world. It amazes me that before the mass extermination of whales, there used to be enough that these communities could all correspond with one another. They'd only be a few kilometers apart and that they could be little stepping stones along a path for all these strange blind creatures, sleeper sharks and eels and clams. And I just love thinking about this great Burger King dropping out of the sky, right? <laughs> Slowly coming down and then these, they're like, oh, that's 40 more years of food, thank you. Uh, I was also uh, working on a novel uh, about two youngsters. This whole time I was working on this story, uh, which I'm sure is the reason many of you are here. And I had a, a girl character who is obsessed with marine biology, so I was reading a lot about marine biology. And you'll see that echoed in the in this story. And I also had a child with a disability in the novel. And uh, one of my friends, an amazing writer, named Brian Doyle in Portland, he had twin boys, I, I have twin boys, and one was born without a chamber in his heart. And I was just so curious about what it would be like uh, to be a parent of that child and how protective or non-protective you should be and how much you should let your child go live and risk, even if the risks are slightly greater for a child like that. So that's part of the story. Uh, I also started it in 2008, and I was on book tour for this book, a little collection of short stories. And every hotel, I don't watch a lot of TV at home, except for sports, but when I'm sometimes tired after events, I'll turn on these programs, like on CNN with Wolf Blitzer or something. And everybody would say, this is the worst recession since the Great Depression. It became almost a cliche. It's funny, if you type worst recession, the, Google will fill in since the Great Depression, right, for you. <laughs> And I wanted to know if that was true. I've been turning my interest towards historical fiction a lot lately, and hopefully you'll see a sense of that, a little bit of a sense of that in this story. Um, you know, so many, at least statistically, the differences are enormous. That, you know, we reached about 10% employment, and during the Depression, unemployment spiked at about 25% in the United States. Okay, and last thing, I got turned on to all these amazing pictures of salt mines. There are, if you ever get a chance to just Google image salt mines, they're just phenomenal. These underground caverns, in this case, they're in Detroit, but all over Europe, uh, there are some in South America. These salt mines that stay, unlike most mining operations, they stay pretty stable after the salt has been excavated, and you can go down in them and see all these striations of time and walk really through the ghost of an ancient ocean underground. It fascinates me. So that's in the story, too. All right, <laughs> hopefully that's enough. <laughs> Intro. Eight minutes later, here we go. <laughs> All right, this is called The Deep. You hear me okay? Okay. Tom is born in 1914 in Detroit, a quarter mile from International Salt. His father is offstage, unaccounted for. His mother operates a six-room under-insulated boarding house populated with locked doors behind which drowse the grim possessions of itinerant salt workers, coats the colors of mice, tattered mucking boots, aqua tints of undressed women, their breasts faded orange. Every six months, a miner is laid off, gets drafted, or dies, and is replaced by another, so that very early in his life, Tom comes to see how the world continually drains itself of young men, leaving behind only objects, empty tobacco pouches, bladeless jackknives, salt-caked trousers, mute, incapable of memory. Tom is four when he starts fainting. He'll be rounding a corner, breathing hard, and the lights will go out. Mother will carry him indoors, set him on the armchair, and send someone for the doctor. Atrial septal defect, hole in the heart. The doctor says blood sloshes from the left side to the right side. His heart will have to do three times the work. Lifespan of 16, 18 if he's lucky. Best if he doesn't get excited. Mother trains her voice into a whisper. Here you go. There you are, sweet little tomcat. 
She moves Tom's cot into an upstairs closet, no bright lights, no loud noises. Mornings, she serves him a glass of buttermilk, then points him to the brooms or steel wool. Go slow, she'll murmur. He scrubs the coal stove, sweeps the marble stoop. Every so often, he peers up from his work and watches the face of the oldest boarder, Mr. Weems, as he troops downstairs, a 50-year-old man hooded against the cold, off to descend in an elevator a thousand feet underground. Tom imagines his descent, sporadic and dim lights passing and receding, cables rattling, a half dozen other miners squeezed into the cage beside him, each thinking his own thoughts, men's thoughts, sinking down into that city beneath the city where mules stand waiting and oil lamps burn in the walls and glittering rooms of salt recede into vast arcades beyond the farthest reaches of the light. Sixteen, thinks Tom, eighteen if I'm lucky. School is a three-room shed a swarm with the offspring of salt workers, coal workers, iron workers. To mother, the schoolyard seems a thousand acres of sizzling pandemonium. Don't run, don't fight, she whispers, no games. His first day, she pulls him out of class after an hour, shh, she says, and wraps her arms around his like ropes. Tom seesaws in and out of the early grades. Sometimes she keeps him out of school for whole weeks at a time. By the time he's 10, he's in remedial everything. I'm trying, he stammers, but letters spin off pages and dash against the windows like snow. Dunce, the other boys declare. And to Tom, that seems about right. He sweeps, scrubs, scours the stoop with pumice one square inch at a time. Every day, all day, the salt finds its way in. It encrusts wash basins, settles on the rims of the baseboards. It spills out of the borders, too. From ears, boots, handkerchiefs, furrows of glitter gather in the bed sheets a daily lesson in insidiousness. Start at the edges, then scrub out the center. Linens on Thursdays, toilets on Fridays. He's 12 when Miss Fredericks asks the children to give reports. Ruby Hornaday goes sixth. Ruby has flames for hair, Christmas for a birthday, and a drunk for a daddy. She's one of two girls to make it to fourth grade. She reads from notes in controlled terror. If you think the lake is big, you should see the sea. It's three quarters of earth, and that's just the surface. Someone throws a pencil, the creases on Ruby's forehead sharpen. Land animals live on ground or in trees, rats and worms and gulls and such. But sea animals, they live everywhere. They live in the waves and they live in midwater and they live in canyons six and a half miles down. She passes around a red book. Inside are blocks of text and full color photographic plates that make Tom's heart boom in his ears. A blizzard of toothy minnows, a kingdom of purple corals. Ruby says, Detroit used to have palm trees and corals and seashells. Detroit used to be a sea three miles deep. Miss Fredericks asks, Ruby, where did you get that book? But by then, Tom is hardly breathing. See through flowers with poison tentacles and fields of clams and pink spheres with a thousand needles on their backs. He tries to ask, are these real? But quicksilver bubbles rise from his mouth and float up to the ceiling. When he goes over, the desk goes over with him. The doctor says it's best if Tom stays out of school, and Mother agrees. Keep indoors, the doctor says. If you get excited, think of something blue. Mother lets him come downstairs for meals and chores only. Otherwise, he's to stay in his closet. We have to be more careful, Tomcat she whispers, and sets her palm on his forehead. Tom spends long hours on the floor beside his cot, assembling and reassembling the same jigsaw puzzle, a Swiss village, 500 pieces, nine of them missing. Sometimes Mr. Weems reads to Tom from adventure novels. They're blasting a new vein down in the mines, and in the lulls between Mr. Weems' words, Tom can feel explosions reverberate up through a thousand feet of rock and shake the fragile pump in his chest. He misses school, he misses the sky, he misses everything. When Mr. Weems is in the mine and Mother is downstairs, Tom often slips to the end of the hall and lifts aside the curtains and presses his forehead to the glass. 
Children run the snowy lanes, and lights glow in the foundry windows, and train cars trundle beneath elevated conduits. First shift miners emerge from the mouth of the hauling elevator in groups of six, and bring out cigarette cases from their overalls, and strike matches, and spill like little salt-dusted insects out into the night while the darker figures of the second shift miners stamp their feet in the cold, waiting outside the cages for their turn in the pit. In dreams, he sees Ruby Hornaday push open the door of his closet. She's wearing a copper diving helmet. She leans over his cot and puts the window of her helmet an inch from his face. He wakes with a shock. Heat pools in his groin. He thinks, blue, blue, blue. You guys doing okay out there? Okay. One drizzly Saturday, the bell rings. When Tom opens the door, Ruby Hornaday is standing on the stoop in the rain. Hello. Tom blinks a dozen times. Raindrops set a thousand intersecting circles upon the puddles in the road. Ruby holds up a jar. Six black tadpoles squirm in an inch of water. Seems like you might be interested in water creatures. Tom tries to answer, but the whole sky is rushing through the open door into his mouth. You're not going to faint again, are you? Mr. Weems stumps into the foyer. Jesus, boy, she's damp as a church. You've got to invite a lady in. Ruby stands on the tiles and drips. Mr. Weems grins. Tom mumbles, my heart. Ruby holds out the jar. Keep them if you want. They'll be frogs before long. Drops shine in her eyelashes. Rain glues her shirt to her clavicles. Well, that's something, says Mr. Weems. He nudges Tom in the back. Isn't it, Tom? Tom is opening his mouth. He's saying, maybe I could when mother comes down the stairs in her big black shoes. Trouble, hisses Mr. Weems. Mother dumps the tadpoles in a ditch. Her face says she's composed. That's exactly what my wife said when she read that part. She was like... <laughs> Her face says she's composing herself, but her eyes say she's going to wipe all this away. Mr. Weems leans over the dominoes and whispers, Mother's as hard as a cobblestone, but we'll crack her, Tom. You wait. Tom whispers, Ruby Hornaday, into the space above his cot. Ruby Hornaday, Ruby Hornaday. A strange and uncontainable joy inflates dangerously in his chest. Mr. Weems initiates long conversations with mother in the kitchen. Tom overhears scraps. Boy needs to move his legs. Boy should get some air. Mother's voice is a whip. He's sick. He's alive. What are you saving him for? She consents to let Tom retrieve coal from the depot and tinned goods from the commissary. Tuesdays, he'll be allowed to walk to the butchers in Dearborn. Careful, Tomcat. Don't hurry. Tom moves through the colony that first Tuesday with something close to rapture in his veins. Down the long gravel lanes, past pit cottages and surface mountains of blue and white salt, the warehouses like dark cathedrals, the hauling machines like demonic armatures. All around him, the monumental industry of Detroit pounds and clangs. The boy tells himself he is a treasure hunter, a hero from one of Mr. Weems's adventure stories, a knight on important errands, a spy behind enemy lines. He keeps his hands in his pockets and his head down and his gait slow, but his soul charges ahead, weightless, jubilant, sparking through the gloom. In May of that year, 1929, 14-year-old Tom is walking along the lane thinking, spring happens whether you're paying attention or not. It happens beneath the snow, beyond the walls. Spring happens in the dark while you dream, when Ruby Hornaday steps out of the weeds. She has a shriveled rubber hose coiled over her shoulder and a swim mask in one hand and a tire pump in the other. Need your help. Tom's pulse soars. I gotta go to the butcher's. Your choice. Ruby turns to go, but really there is no choice at all. She leads him west, away from the mine, through mounds of rusting machines. They hop a fence, cross a field gone to seed, and walk a quarter mile through pitch pines to a marsh where cattle egrets stand in the cattails like white flowers. In my mouth, she says, and starts picking up rocks. Out my nose. You pump, Tom. Understand? 
In, in the green water two feet down, Tom can make out the dim shapes of a few fish gliding through weedy enclaves. Ruby pitches the far end of the hose into the water. With waxed cord, she binds the other end to the pump. Then she fills her pockets with rocks. She wades out, looks back, says, you pump, and puts the hose into her mouth. The swim mask goes over her eyes. Her face goes into the water. The marsh closes over Ruby's back, and the hose trends away from the bank. Tom begins to pump. The sky slides along overhead. Loops of garden hose float under the light out there, shifting now and then. Occasional bubbles rise, moving gradually farther out. One minute, two minutes. Tom pumps. His heart does its fragile work. He should not be here. He should not be here while this skinny, spellbinding girl drowns herself in a marsh, if that's what she's doing. After four or five minutes underwater, Ruby comes up. A neon mat of algae clings to her hair, and her bare feet are great boots of mud. She pushes through the cattails. Strings of saliva hang off her chin. Her lips are blue. Tom feels dizzy. The sky turns liquid. Incredible, pants Ruby, fucking incredible. She holds up her wet, rock-filled trousers with both hands and looks at Tom through the wavy lens of her swim mask. He has to trot to make the butchers and get back home by noon. It is the first time Tom can remember permitting himself to run, and his legs feel like glass. At the end of the lane, a hundred yards from home, he stops and pants with the basket of meat in his arms and spits a pat of blood into the dandelions. Sweat soaks his shirt, dragonflies dart and hover, swallows inscribe letters across the sky. The street seems to ripple and fold and straighten itself out again. Just a hundred yards more, he forces his heart to settle. Everything, Tom thinks, follows a path worn by those who have gone before. Egrets, clouds, tadpoles, everything, everything, everything. The following Tuesday, Ruby meets him at the end of the lane, and the Tuesday after that. They hop the fence, cross the field. She leads him places he's never dreamed existed, places where the structures of the salt works become white mirages on the horizon, places where sunlight washes through groves of maples and makes the ground quiver with leaf shadow. They peer into a foundry where men in masks pour molten iron from one vat into another, they climb a tailings pile where a lone sapling grows like a single hand thrust up from the underworld. That's a sentence I just took and shoved into the novel. It's funny. There's a couple in here I'm noticing like that. I'm like, well, that sentence is fine. I'll just use it again. Tom knows he's risking everything, his freedom, mother's trust, even his life. But how can he stop? How can he say no? To say no to Ruby Hornaday would be to say no to the world. Some Tuesdays, Ruby brings along her red book with its images of corals and jellies and underwater volcanoes. She tells him that when she grows up, she'll go to parties where hostesses row guests offshore and everyone puts on special helmets to go for strolls along the sea bottom. She tells him she'll be a diver who sinks herself a half mile into the sea in a steel ball with one window. In the basement of the ocean, she says, she'll find a separate universe, a place made of lights, schools of fish glowing green, living galaxies wheeling through the black. In the ocean, says Ruby, half the rocks are alive, half the plants are animals. They hold hands. She stuffs his mind full of kelp forests and seascapes and dolphins. When I grow up, says Ruby, when I grow up. Four more times, Ruby walks around beneath the surface of a Rouge River marsh while Tom stands on the bank working the pump. Four more times, he watches her rise back out like a fever. Amphibian, she laughs. It means two lives. Then Tom runs to the butchers and runs home, and his heart races and spots spread like ink blots in front of his eyes. Sometimes in the afternoons, when he stands up from his chores, his vision slides away in violet streaks. He sees the glowing white of the salt tunnels, the red of Ruby's book, the orange of her hair. He imagines her all grown up, standing on the bow of a ship, and feels a core of light flaring brighter and brighter within him. It spills from the slats between his ribs, from between his teeth, from the pupils of his eyes. He thinks, it is so much, so much. So now you're 15, and the doctor says 16, 18 if I'm lucky. 
Ruby turns her book over in her hands. What's it like to know you won't get all the years you should? I don't feel so shortchanged when I'm with you, he wants to say, but his voice breaks at short and the sentence fractures. They kiss only that one time. It is clumsy. He shuts his eyes and leans in, but something shifts and Ruby is not where he expects her to be. Their teeth clash. When he opens his eyes, she is looking off to her left, smiling slightly, smelling of mud, and the thousand tiny blonde hairs on her upper lip catch the light. The second to last time Tom and Ruby are together, on the last Tuesday of October 1929, everything is strange. The hose leaks, Ruby is upset, a curtain has fallen somehow between them. Go back, Ruby says. It's probably noon already. You'll be late. But she sounds as if she's speaking to him through a tunnel. Freckles flow and bloom across her face. The light goes out of the marsh. On the long path through the pitch pines, it begins to rain. Tom makes it to the butcher's and back home with the basket and the ground veal. But when he opens the door to Mother's parlor, the curtains blow inward. The chairs leave their places and come scraping toward him. The daylight thins to a pair of beams waving back and forth. And Mr. Weems passes in front of his eyes. But Tom hears no footsteps. No voices, only an, in, only an internal rushing and the wet metronome of his exhalations. Suddenly he's a diver staring through a thick foggy window into a world of immense pressure. He's walking around on the bottom of the sea. Mother's lips say, haven't I given enough? Lord God, haven't I tried? Then she's gone. In something deeper than a dream, Tom walks the salt roads a thousand feet beneath the house. At first, it's all darkness, but after what might be a minute or a day or a year, he sees little flashes of green light out there in distant galleries hundreds of feet away. Each flash initi initiates a chain reaction of further flashes beyond it, so that when he turns in a slow circle, he can perceive great flowing signals of light in all directions, tunnels of green arcing out into the blackness, each flash glowing for only a moment before fading, but in that moment repeating everything that came before, everything that will come next. He wakes to a deflated world. The newspapers are full of suicides. The price of gas has tripled. The miners whisper that the salt works are in trouble. Quart milk bottles sell for a dollar a piece. There's no butter, hardly any meat. Fruit becomes a memory. Most nights, mother serves only cabbage and soda bread and salt. No more trips to the butcher. The butcher closes anyway. By November, mother's borders are vanishing. Mr. Beeson goes first, then Mr. Fackler. Tom waits for Ruby to come to the door, but she doesn't show. Images of her climb the undersides of his eyelids, and he rubs them away. Each morning, he clambers out of his closet and carries his traitorous heart down to the kitchen like an egg. The world is swallowing people like candy boy, says Mr. Weems. No one is leaving addresses. Mr. Hansen goes next, then Mr. Heathcock. By April, the salt works is operating only two days a week, and Mr. Weems, mother, and Tom are alone at supper. 16, 18, if he's lucky. Tom moves his few things into one of the empty boarder's rooms on the first floor, and Mother doesn't say a word. He thinks of Ruby Hornaday, her pale blue eyes, her loose flames of hair. Is she out there in the city somewhere right now, or is she 3,000 miles away? Then he sets his questions aside. Mother catches a fever in 1932. It eats her from the inside. She still puts on her high-waisted dresses, ties on her apron. She still cooks every meal and presses Mr. Weems' suit every Sunday. But within a month, she has become somebody else, an empty demon in mother's clothes, perfectly upright at the table, eyes smoldering, nothing on her plate. She has a way of putting her hand on Tom's forehead while he works. Tom will be hauling coal or amending a pipe or sweeping the parlor, the sun cold and white behind the curtains, and Mother will appear from nowhere and put her icy palm over his eyebrows, and he'll close his eyes and feel his heart tear just a little more. Amphibian, it means two lives. Mr. Weems is let go. He puts on his suit, packs up his dominoes, and leaves an address downtown. I thought no one was leaving addresses. You're true as a map, Tom, true as the magnet to the iron, and tears spill from the old miner's eyes. One blue morning not long after that, for the first time in Tom's memory, Mother is not at the stove when he enters the kitchen. 
He finds her upstairs, sitting on her bed, fully dressed in her coat and shoes, with her rosary clutched to her chest. The room is spotless, the house wadded with silence. Payments are due on the 15th. Her voice is ash. The flashing on the roof needs replacing. There's $91 in the dresser. Mother, shh, Tomcat, she hisses. Don't get yourself worked up. Tom manages two more payments, then the bank comes for the house. He walks in a daze through blowing sleet to the end of the lane and turns right and staggers through the dry weeds till he finds the old path and walks beneath the creaking pitch pines to Ruby's Marsh. Ice has interlocked in the shallows, but the water in the center is as dark as molten pewter. He stands there a long time. Into the gathering darkness, he says, I'm still here, but where are you? His blood sloshes to and fro, and snow gathers in his eyelashes, and three ducks come spiraling out of the night and land silently on the water. The next morning, he walks past the padlocked gate of International Salt with $14 in his pocket. He rides the trackless trolley downtown for a nickel and gets off on Washington Boulevard. Between the buildings, the sun comes up the color of steel, and Tom raises his face to it but feels no warmth at all. He walks slowly toward the address he's copied and recopied onto a sheet of mother's writing paper. Frozen furrows of plowed snow are shored up against the buildings, and the little golden windows high above seem miles away. It's a boarding house. Mr. Weems is at a lopsided table playing dominoes by himself. He looks up, says, holy shit, sure is gravity, and spills his tea. By a miracle, Mr. Weems has a grandniece who manages the owl shift in the maternity ward at City General. Maternity is on the fourth floor. In the elevator, Tom cannot tell if he's ascending or descending. The niece looks him up and down and checks his eyes and tongue for fever and hires him on the spot. World goes to Hades, but babies still get born, she says, and issues him white coveralls. Ten hours a night, six nights a week, Tom roves the halls with carts of laundry, taking soiled blankets and diapers down to the cellar, bringing clean blankets and diapers up. Rainy nights are the busiest. Full moons and holidays are tied for second. God forbid a rainy holiday with a full moon. Doctors walk the rows of beds injecting expecting mothers with morphine and something called scopolamine that makes them forget. Sometimes there are screams. Sometimes Tom's heart pounds for no reason he can identify. In the delivery rooms, there's always new blood on the tiles to replace the old blood Tom has just mopped away. The halls are bright at every hour, but out the windows the darkness presses very close. And in the leanest hours of those nights, Tom gets a sensation like the hospital is deep underwater, the floor rocking gently, the lights of neighborhood buildings like glimmering schools of fish, the pressure of the sea all around. He turns 18, then 19. All the listless figures he sees, children humped around the hospital entrance, their eyes vacant with hunger, farmers pouring into the parks, families sleeping without cover, people for whom nothing left on earth could be surprising. There are so many of them, as if somewhere out in the countryside, great farms pump out thousands of ruined men every minute, as if the ones shuffling down the sidewalks are but fractions of the multitudes behind them. And yet, is there not goodness, too? Are people not helping one another in these derelict places? Tom splits his wages with Mr. Weems. He brings home discarded newspapers and wrestles his way through the words on the funny pages. He turns 20, and Mr. Weems bakes a mushy pound cake full of eggshells and sets 20 matchsticks in it, and Tom blows them all out. He faints at work, once in the elevator, twice in the big pulsing laundry room in the basement. Mostly he's able to hide it, but one night he faints in the hall outside the waiting room. A nurse named Fran hauls him into a closet. Can't let them see you like that, she says, and wipes his face, and he washes back into himself. The closet is more than a closet. The air is warm, steamy, it smells like soap. On one wall is a two-basin sink. Heat lamps are bolted to the undersides of the cabinets. Set in the opposite wall are two little doors. Tom returns to the same chair in the corner of Fran's room whenever he starts to feel dizzy. Three, four, occasionally ten times a night, he watches a nurse carry an utterly newborn baby through the little door on the left and deposit it on the counter in front of Fran. 
She plucks off little knit caps and unwraps blankets. Their bodies are scarlet or imperial purple. They have tiny bright red fingers, no eyebrows, no kneecaps, no expression except a constant bewildered wince. Her voice is a whisper. Why, here she is. There he goes. Okay now, baby, just lift you here. Their wrists are the circumference of Tom's pinky. Fran takes a new washcloth from a stack, dips it in warm water, and wipes every inch of the creature, ears, armpits, eyelids, washing away bits of placenta, dried blood, all the milky fluids that accompanied it into this world. Meanwhile, the child stares up at her with blank, memorizing eyes, peering into the newness of all things, knowing what? Only light and dark, only mother, only fluid. Fran dries the baby and splays her fingers beneath its head and diapers it and tugs its hat back on. She whispers, here you are. See what a good girl you are. Down you go. And with one free hand lays out two new crit wrap wrap turn and sets her in a rolling bassinet for Tom to wheel into the nursery where she'll wait with the others beneath the lights like loaves of bread. Here's the whale fall, finally. <laughs> You can see you start with these pages and pages about stuff and they only get whittled down into a sentence. In a magazine, Tom finds a color photograph of a 300-year-old skeleton of a bowhead whale stranded on a coastal plain in a place called Finland. He tears it out, studies it in the lamplight. See, he murmurs to Mr. Weems, how the flowers closest to it are the brightest. See how the closest leaves are the darkest green. He is 21 and fainting three times a week when one Wednesday in January he sees among the drugged, dazed mothers in their rows of beds the unmistakable face of Ruby Hornaday. Flaming orange hair, freckles sprayed across her cheeks, hands folded in her lap, a thin gold wedding ring on her finger. The material of the ward ripples. Tom leans on the handle of his cart to keep from falling. Blue, he whispers, blue, blue, blue. He retreats to his chair in the corner of Fran's washing room and tries to suppress his heart. Any minute he thinks her baby will come through that door. Two hours later, he pushes his cart into the post delivery room and Ruby is gone. Tom's shift ends, he rides the elevator down. Outside, rain settles lightly on the city. The street lights glow yellow. The early morning avenues are empty except for the occasional automobile passing with a damp sigh. Tom steadies himself with a hand against the bricks and closes his eyes. A police officer helps him home. All that day, Tom lies on his stomach in his rented bed and recopies the letter until little sons burst behind his eyes. This is a letter with a lot of misspellings in it. Dear Ruby, I saw you in the hospital and I saw your baby too. His eyes are very pretty. Fran says later they will probably get blue. Mother is gone and I am lonely as the Arctic Sea. That night at the hospital, Fran finds the address. Tom includes the photo of the whale skeleton from the magazine and sticks on an extra stamp for luck. He thinks, see how the flowers closest to it are brightest. See how the closest leaves are the darkest green. He sleeps, pays his rent, walks the 31 blocks to work. He checks the mail every day. And winter pales and spring strengthens and Tom loses a bit of hope. One morning over breakfast, Mr. Weems looks at him and says, you ain't even here, Tom. You got one foot across the river. You got to pull back to our side. But that very day it comes. Here's another letter. Dear Tom, I liked hearing from you. It hasn't been 10 years, but it feels like a thousand. I'm married, you probably guessed that. The baby is Arthur. Maybe his eyes will turn blue, they just might. A bald president is on the stamp. The paper smells like paper, nothing more. Tom runs a finger beneath every word, sounding them out, making sure he hasn't missed anything. One more letter. I know you're married, and I don't want anything but happiness for you, but maybe I can see you one time. We could meet at the aquarium. If you don't write back, that's okay. I know why. Two more weeks. Dear Tom, I don't want anything but happiness for you, too. How about next Tuesday? I'll bring the baby, okay? The next Tuesday, the first one in May, Tom leaves the hospital after his shift. His vision flickers at the edges and he hears mother's voice. Be careful, Tomcat, it's not worth the risk. He walks slowly to the end of the block and catches the first trolley to Belle Isle where he steps off into a golden dawn. The face of the aquarium is gothic and wrapped in vines. He finds a bench outside and waits for his pulse to steady. 
The reticulated glass roofs of the flower conservatory reflect a passing cloud. Eventually, a man in overalls opens the gate, and Tom buys two tickets, then thinks about the baby and buys a third. He returns to the bench with the three tickets in his trembling fingers. By 11, the sky is filled with a platinum haze, and the island is busy. Men on bicycles crackle along the paths. A girl flies a yellow kite. Tom? Ruby Hornaday materializes before him, shoulders erect, hair newly short, pushing a chrome and canvas baby buggy. He stands quickly, and the park bleeds away and then restores itself. Sorry I'm late, she says. She's dignified, slim, two quick strokes for eyebrows, the same narrow nose, no makeup, no jewelry, those pale blue eyes and that hair. She cocks her head slightly. Look at you, all grown up. I got tickets, he says. How's Mr. Weems? Oh, he's made of salt. He'll live forever. They start down the path between the rows of benches and the shining trees. Occasionally, she takes his arm to steady him, though her touch only disorients him more. I thought maybe you were far away, he says. I thought maybe you went to sea. Ruby parks the buggy and lifts the baby to her chest. He's wrapped in a blue afghan. And then they're through the turnstile. The aquarium is dim and damp and lined on both sides with glass-fronted tanks. Ferns hang from the ceiling, and little boys lean across the brass railings and press their noses to the glass. I think he likes it, Ruby says. Don't you, baby? The boy's eyes are wide open. Fish swim slow ellipses behind the glass. They see translucent squid, sparkling pink octopi like floating lanterns, cowfish in blue and violet and gold. Iridescent green tiles gleam on the domed ceiling and throw wavering patterns of light across the floor. In a circular pool at the very center of the building, dark shapes race back and forth in coordination. Jacks, Ruby murmurs, aren't they? Tom blinks. You're pale, she says. Tom shakes his head. She helps him back out into the daylight beneath the sky and the trees. The baby lies in the buggy, sucking his fist, examining the clouds with great intensity, and Ruby guides Tom to a bench. Cars and trucks and a white limousine pass slowly along the white bridge high over the river. The city glitters in the distance. Thank you, says Tom. For what? For this. How old are you now, Tom? Twenty-one, same as you. A breeze stirs the trees and the leaves vibrate with light. Everything is radiant. World goes to Hades, but babies still get born, says Tom. Ruby peers into the buggy and adjusts something, and for a moment the back of her neck shows between her hair and collar. The sight of those two knobs of vertebrae sheathed in her pale skin fills Tom with a longing that cracks the lawns open. For a moment, it seems Ruby is slowly being dragged away from him, as if he is a swimmer caught in a rip, and with every stroke, the back of her neck recedes farther into the distance. Then she sits back, and the park heals over, and he can feel the bench become solid beneath him once more. I used to think, Tom says, that I had to be careful with how much I lived, as if life was a pocket full of coins. You only got so much and you didn't want to spend it all in one place. Ruby looks at him, her eyelashes whisk up and down. But now I know life is the one thing in the world that never runs out. I might run out of mine, and you might run out of yours, but the world will never run out of life, and we're all very lucky to be a part of something like that. She holds his gaze. Some deserve more luck than they've gotten. Tom shakes his head. He closes his eyes. I've been lucky, too. I've been absolutely lucky. The baby begins to fuss, a whine building to a cry. Ruby says, hungry. A trap door opens in the gravel between Tom's feet, black as a keyhole, and he glances down. You'll be okay? I'll be okay. Goodbye, Tom. She touches his forearm once and then goes, pushing the buggy through the crowds. He watches her disappear in pieces, first her legs, then her hips, then her shoulders, and finally the back of her bright head. And then Tom sits, hands in his lap, alive for one more day.
First of all, everybody, we want to check that you can hear us on these mics, our Secret Service mics here. That's good? Okay. Well, wonderful story. Thank you so much for that reading. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. That felt like... I think, I think the phrase rapt attention comes to oh, mind that's to nice. describe their... There's our, so our many jokes that. in the story. You, you, uh, when I was in graduate school, one of my mentors said, you, you know, when you do readings, always choose a funny story. And so I, I remember like, there's really not a lot of funny moments in that story. <laughs> but it is a story, I think, Tony, that is emblematic of your wide-ranging and fearless imagination. And when we hear a sentence like, and I didn't memorize this, folks. I read the story beforehand, uh, cheating a little bit. Iridescent green tiles gleam on the dome ceiling and throw wavering patterns of light across the floor. Now, when we hear that or when we read that, we are convinced that we are in that Detroit okay. aquarium in 1935. How did you get us there? Oh, that's so nice. That's easy. I remember exactly. I was looking at old postcards. I got a bunch of old postcards from Belle Isle, and they were kind of um, colorized. I don't really know. You know, obviously the picture was taken in black and white, and it's sort of probably clumsily colorized. And uh, yeah, the flower conservatory detail, all those details I'm just stealing from lame research. Images are really important to me. A lot of all the light we cannot see, I was looking at. Um, all kinds of photographs, Sears catalogs for like what might be on a girl's dresser in 1938, to um, you know as many images of the museum and Paris that I could find in the you know the decade leading up to the 40s. Particularity of detail is something that's very very important to you. Yeah, you know um, there's so many amazing writing teachers here. Um, Somebody once told me, you know, it's, it's like the, the broken glass scattered on the top of the dam, or it's the broken glass scattered in the parking lot catching the light that really suddenly delivers you there. I got into reading because, uh, I mean, I was a very happy kid, but I wanted to go into other lives and other places. And, um, you know, my very first, like, true drug dealer experience was C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. You know, I mean, like, my mom was like the dealer, right? She came in and read all those books to us, and I was hooked. It it's was... illegal in some states. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Librarians are drug dealers. It's great. And, uh, you know, that uh, trans... I would be so transported out of my room into Narnia that it seemed more real to me than my own life in some ways. And I've been chasing that ever since. When I, when I start feeling unhappy, I'm, I've realized that it's probably because I finished a book, I mean, finished reading a book, and I, I, I kind of need like three streams to be going to stay happy. I need to be a, living my life, and then I need to be in this world of a book I'm reading that I'm engaged in, yeah. I get to be in that world, and then also writing a book, and so I get to kind of live in these three spaces during the day. And if I can hit each one at some point during the day, I feel like my life's in balance. A That's a good day. Yeah. Now, you gave us some great insights into where this story came from. I think a lot of people would like to know where this story, this big story, came from. Uh, I sense that people would also like to hear a little bit from All the Light. We may have a few people here who've, uh, who've read it. So you've got a passage picked out that's going to be a kind of entree into this world of All the Light, and you'll give us a little bit of a sneak peek about the genesis of okay, this Okay, sure. Right? That sounds good clearly set up. Well done. <laughs> um, okay, so the story I tell a lot, uh, so forgive me if you've heard it already, um, the, the, kind of the genesis moment of this novel was um, 2004, so you get a picture like Bush Carey, you're going to go back then. Um, I was at Princeton for a year and was taking the train from Princeton to New York City to see my publisher. This was I mean, there was email, but they still wanted me for some reason to see the cover of About Grace, which was my second book, in person. So I remember it was like, okay, I'm going up there to see this. And the man in the seat in front of me was talking on his 2004 cell phone about something really important. It was the sequel to The Matrix. <laughs> so he's talking about Keanu Reeves. And, you know, you're probably going, I'm sure some of you may have been on that train, you may be going 60 miles an hour, that's a guess. As you start going to the city, you start kind of going underground. Steel and concrete are flowing above the train. And his call dropped. And this guy got very angry. He's right in front of me. And he got kind of frighteningly angry. Unreasonably would be my adverb. 
uh, and swearing and kind of rapping his knuckles on his phone. And, you know, I, I started thinking what he's forgetting, but really what all of us are forgetting is that what he's trying to do is a miracle. Like, how do we get to the point where we think this should be working underground yeah, at 60 yeah. miles an hour? <laughs> You're using this thing no bigger than a deck of cards to, you know, using the speed of light, invisible light, flying between radio towers, you know, miles apart, rebounding at the speed of light to talk to somebody who might, as far as I know, be in Madagascar. And he's using this magic to have a conversation about Keanu Reeves, you know? <laughs> right? Like, just think of all the inane texts right now flying past us invisibly. Like, I love you, but you don't love me back. You know, it's like flying right past us. Get avocados! It just flew past me. <laughs> so that day, uh, titles are hard for me. I don't know how they are for you, but they usually come very late. Um, but that day I wrote the phrase all the light we cannot see into my notebook and I was primarily thinking about radio and this um, I, I just com I felt very compelled to try to conjure up a time for a reader when to hear the voice of a stranger or of a loved one uh, in your ear uh, for somebody who might be hundreds of miles away was a miracle because for the whole history of humanity accepting the past maybe four generations, that was impossible. You had to be in the same room as the person you're talking to, as you all know. Uh, although there's really interesting studies about Nigerian drumming that they were able to transmit really complicated messages like, she's pregnant, get home, over drums, over a long... <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Uh, so anyway, uh, and it reminded me of, I grew up in Cleveland, um, and I loved baseball and the terribly racist name, the Cleveland Indians, and uh, I would listen to those games after my parents thought I was in bed by putting a, you know, cover over my head and listening on this little crystal radio. So this idea that I could get a story from far away through in, with invisible light really compelled me. So at first night, I just started a story, and all I knew was I had a girl transmitting a story to a boy over a radio, and I conceived that he needed this story somehow as a kind of salvation for him, and I also thought of him as trapped. Early on, I knew she was sightless, and that maybe she was a more capable human being, at least maybe morally than the boy, um, but that's really all I had at first. Just started playing around with radio and reading the beginning of radio. Okay, so you guys sh sure you want to hear more? Oh, yes, okay, indeed. okay. Yeah. This is quite short. Um, this is a each of the chapters is, is 176, I think, chapters in this novel, which is absurd. And um, this the, each one has a title, and this one's called Radio, and it's um, it's 1935, pretty sure. Uh, and Werner, all you think you really need to know at this point is that he has a little sister named Yetta. Werner is eight years old and ferreting about, oh, and he lives in a coal mining town called Solferein in Germany. Yeah, and he's eight, year olds, eight years old and ferreting about in the refuse behind a storage shed when he discovers what looks like a large spool of thread. It consists of a wire-wrapped cylinder sandwiched between two disks of pine wood. Three frayed electrical leads sprout from the top. One has a small earphone dangling from its end. Yetta, six years old, with a round face and a mashed cumulus of white hair, crouches beside her brother. What is that? I think, Verna says, feeling as though some cupboard in the sky has just opened. We just found a radio. Until now, he has seen radios only in glimpses, a big cabinet wireless through the lace curtains of an official's house, a portable unit in a miner's dormitory, another in the church refectory. He has never touched one. He and Yetta smuggle the device back to Victoria Strasse number three and appraise it beneath an electric lamp. They wipe it clean, untangle the snarl of wires, wash mud out of, out of the earphone. It does not work. Other children come and stand over them and marvel, then gradually lose interest and conclude it is hopeless. But Werner carries the receiver up to his attic dormer and studies it for hours. He disconnects everything that will disconnect. He lays its parts out on the floor and holds them one by one to the light. Three weeks after finding the device on a sun-gilded afternoon when perhaps every other child in Solferine is outdoors, he notices that its longest wire, a slender filament coiled hundreds of times around the central cylinder, has several small breaks in it. Slowly, meticulously, he unwraps the coil, carries the entire looped mess downstairs, and calls Yutta inside to hold the pieces for him while he splices the brakes. Then he rewraps it. Now let's try, he whispers, and presses the earphone against his ear and runs what he has decided must be the tuning pin back and forth along the coil. 
He hears a fizz of static. Then, from somewhere deep inside the earpiece, a stream of consonants issues forth. His heart pauses. The voice seems to echo in the architecture of his head. The sound fades as quickly as it came. He shifts the pin a quarter inch more static. Another quarter inch, nothing. In the kitchen, Frau Elena, she runs the little orphanage, needs bread. Boys shout in the alley. He guides the tuning pin back and forth, static, static. He is about to hand the earphone to Yutta when clear and unblemished about halfway down the coil, he hears the quick drastic strikes of a bow dashing across the strings of a violin. He tries to hold the pin perfectly still. A second violin joins the first. Yetta drags herself closer. She watches her brother with outsized eyes. A piano chases the violins, then woodwinds. The strings sprint, woodwinds fluttering behind. More instruments join in. Flutes? Harps? Werner? Yetta whispers. He blinks. He has to swallow back tears. The parlor looks the same as it always has. Two cribs beneath two Latin crosses, dust floating in the open mouth of the stove, a dozen layers of paint peeling off the baseboards, a needlepoint of Frau Elena's snowy Alsatian village above the sink. Yet now there is music, as if inside his head an infinitesimal orchestra has stirred to life. The room seems to fall into a slow spin. His sister says his name more urgently, and he presses the earphone to her ear. Music, she says. He holds the pin as stock still as he can. The signal is weak enough that though the earphone is six inches away, he can't hear any trace of the song. But he watches his sister's face, motionless except for her eyelids. And in the kitchen, Frau Elena holds her flower-whitened hands in the air and cocks her head, studying Werner. And two older boys rush in and stop, sensing some change in the air. And the little radio with its four terminals and trailing aerial sits motionless on the floor between them all like a miracle. Thank you. Now, two, uh, two can play at that game, Mr. Doerr, okay. of reading from Do all it. the light we cannot see. Because there you have one of the, the technical marvels and the technical miracles uh, that inform your, your fiction so much. But of course, the backdrop of this novel is that history is becoming a nightmare. And these are very dark times that uh, Werner and Marie Lohr are, are living through the 1930s and 1940s. And much later on in the novel, uh, here's, here's uh, again something from Werner's experience. Someone coughs, someone else moans. A train sounds its lonesome whistle somewhere out beyond the lakes. To the east, always the trains move to the east, beyond the rims of the hills. They go to the huge trodden borderlands of the front. Even as he sleeps, the trains are moving, the catapults of history rattling past. How do you take something as vast and as intimidating as World War II? How do you grab hold of those catapults of history and begin to humanize that time for us? Um, well, gosh, I mean, I don't think I can do it very well, but the idea of humanism and fiction writing in general is to do that, to say, you are not alone, and let me show you how another person has lived. And uh, whether it's in contemporary time or not, it's setting a, um, a moment through an individual in time and place and through the particulars of that existence. And I think that's how you transport people. That's what the true lesson of all writing, even rhetoric is, is that you transport people through the particulars. I have so many students who want to reach for the universal. Like, I want to write about love. I want to write about vampires or something. And uh, it's, so, it's such a simple lesson, but it's so hard to learn at the beginning that you know, they'll say something like, I, I, said, I made no details in the dormitory because I wanted it to seem like all the dormitories in the world. And the ir ironic thing is to make it seem like all the dormitories in the world, you have to make it one particular, utterly unique vampire dormitory or whatever these stories yeah. are. Uh, and you know, I think that's what... That's what art is. It puts you in the life of somebody else. It estranges you from your own life, and 
yet ultimately connects you back to your own life by showing you that people cry for the same reasons, they get afraid for the same reasons, they fall in love for the same reasons that you do. Whether it's uh, Emma Bovary in 1840-something or it's um, somebody on Neptune in 2300, if the fiction's done well, I believe in the, the love on Neptune just as much as love in Finland in 1600. Well, the imagination soars in this novel, but it's also tethered to, to reality. There's a lot of real stories behind all the light we cannot see. And, and one, of the, one of the phases of the novel that really fascinated and terrified me was Werner's time in one of these Napola mm. schools. And I was even astonished to learn, did a little bit of research, that the particular Napola school that he's in, School Forta, I think yeah, you say? Yeah, got it. That was a real place. A real that, place. That you weren't making that up as kind of know. emblematic of, of these Napoli schools. Could you explain a little bit about this, this terrifying educational system and how you came to find out about it? Um, yeah, yeah, there were about two dozen. Napoli is just a German acronym uh, that I won't get, uh, but it's the National Political Institutes of Education, and they were... Um, theoretically made for the common man, um, but they were often a place where a party elite would send their kids. Um, Hence all the difficulty with Frederick being there. Exactly. Which you can learn about yeah. Um, yeah, I hate to exclude anybody who doesn't know the book, but basically they were, um, you know, of all the terrible things that have happened in the United States the past few decades, we have, at least maybe in the past 10 years, had a, a I think, I would argue, although some people may have had different experiences, a really uh, wonderful uh, increase in awareness about bullying and I think um, my sons are finding a lot less bullying in their lives than even maybe I did, although I didn't encounter too much. Being Caucasian and male, of course, didn't hurt. Um, but these schools were predicated on bullying to such an extent that even, even though it's only 70 years ago, it's utterly shocking. In fact, yeah. I'm downplaying the level of violence yes. that the students yeah. were encouraged to do to each other in the novel quite a bit. Part, part of it was because my wife was like, I can't take any more. You know? <laughs> um, but uh, I just will allude to it occasionally, this game where... Um, they have 12 red jerseys and 12 blue jerseys, and they put them on 24 boys, and the game ends when one group has all the other colored jerseys. And the whole point was to strengthen the body and to, quote, drive out the weakest. All this horrific, uh, you know, language of racial purification being drilled at them. At the same time, where they're teaching fairly uh, impressive science and accurate science. So, you know, that whole idea that Germany was innovating technically in some valuable ways um, uh, is interesting although of course uh, in terms of like ex awful medical experiments done at the camps and Joseph Mengele and like the idea that he maybe contributed something to genetics is so absurd he was just torturing people basically and cloaking it in the awful rhetoric of science in that case but uh, in some cases in these schools they were teaching valid engineering and so that just fascinated me that one class you're learning you know electromagnetism and the next class you're learning just phrenology or just god awful ways to hate people really um, it's not just the humans who are characters in your novels. I mean, uh, and I really recommend this to a lot of people. Your tour de force first novel about grace, it seemed to me that water itself is a character throughout those, those 400 pages. And, I, and it seems that in all the light, maybe Saint Malo, the town of Saint Malo, becomes an important character or protagonist in the book. Can, can you tell us about your relationship with Saint Malo? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, about a year after the guy on the train was complaining and I was kind of grappling around with, all I had was this blind girl reading this story. I didn't know what story it was. I didn't know when they would be alive. I just wanted it to be in a time when radio was important. Uh, so this would be 2005. I went on book tour to France, um, which sounds glamorous, and it is, <laughs> but um, by maybe day eight or nine, uh, our editor, Francisi, kind of works us hard, and um, uh, I think it was the last day, maybe the ninth day, pretty tired, and we went to Brittany. I was so ignorant about Brittany that I thought it, I, it was in Britain, like that's how much I knew before I got there, <laughs> first time. And it was dark, which is important, because I didn't get to see the sea, and um, we go uh, into 
a restaurant right away. Often they would take you to these dinners with journalists and, you know, it's a lot of smoking. I don't smoke, and especially 2005, it's just like, Anthony, you know, tell me about the symbolism <laughs> of the owl <laughs> on page 200. And, you, you know, it's always some tiny room, and then, <sighs> you're like, well. So um, I think... You know, we, I put in my good first two hours, like so many oysters had come and gone, and I just sneaked out the back door of this restaurant. We were in the town of San Malo, I didn't know what that meant, and walked up about three or four flights of stone steps and found myself atop the ramparts that surround the city. For those of you who have been there, it's a walled medieval city. It's on the jacket of the American edition of the book. And uh, it was night, low tide, a uh, pretty big moon, almost full. And, you know, the huge tides, as many of you know, in Normandy and Brittany. So the tide was probably half a mile out. And, you know, all that wet sand is gleaming. And then you're even with what Americans would call probably the third story of these apartments. And the lights are on and you can see, you know, everybody going about their night and, you know, drinking wine. And, uh, it just... It just felt like I had stumbled into an Italo Calvino story in yes. some ways, you know? Like, what, I didn't know a place like this still existed. And also maybe um, an M.C. Escher etching. Do you guys know those yeah. etchings? You know, like, you're, I'm somehow in a puzzle, which really started to inform the novel almost immediately, really, that idea of, like, a model and a puzzle. But the next day, like a foolish American, we had the day off, and that really was a day that maybe changed my life, I'm realizing now. Uh, but we got to finally have a day off, and I was walking around the town. I really walked everywhere. Um, walked to saint Sevran, which is a near town in Dinan. Uh, but I was walking with my editor at one point in the afternoon, and like classic foolish American, I was saying all these ridiculous things like, look how old everything is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Robert is Irish, in case you don't know. I'm like, oh, this town is so old. And he said, you know, actually, the town was, I think it's like 86% destroyed. The town was almost entirely destroyed at the end of the Second World War by Allied bombs, primarily American bombs. This is the first time napalm was used in warfare, was in San Malo. And, you know, first you're like, what an incredible act of erasure and memory that, you know, for 10 years they painstakingly rebuilt it to the point where blo certain blocks were being oriented in the exact way. And I think this is utterly anecdotal and a guess, but I would say 30% of the people who go visit San Malo now, it's a pretty popular tourist destination, don't realize that this town was rebuilt in the late 40s and 50s. So I kind of fell in love with the place and uh, I would go back, um, you know, which when you're writing a novel, I, I, as you know, you know, to tell your family, like, now I need to go to Europe, to France for, yeah, yeah. for a pretty long time. <laughs> You know, have fun with these two babies that are screaming. I'll just get myself to the airport. Don't worry. <laughs> you know. Oh, no, it won't cost that much. Uh, so, you know, it's very, very scary. You know, my family is like, you know, it's on the line in some ways. And so you never know if a project, you can even finish it. And if you can, you know, a lot of my short stories in particular sort of cave in after five or 18 or 30 pages. You don't quite know what they are until you start working on them. So, you know, going back to San Malo, I have a lot of memories of, you know, I would rent these little tiny apartments and just trying to talk to people, trying to walk around, and also being afraid all the time, like, is this project ridiculous? I'm an American, and I'm trying to write about a culture that isn't mine, and all I have are journals and photographs and people's memories, and am I being respectful enough of them and of the place? So, yeah, a lot of fear. But that's a good place to be working from, I think, also. Because I still felt very passionate about that through line of this stories traveling invisibly through walls. You know, I still feel so amazed by that, when, that I can be driving through Idaho, where I live now, and hear whatever, this American life or something, just beaming invisibly into my car. That and magic. Keanu Reeves. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> or I can put Netflix with Keanu Reeves. So, <laughs> we've talked about... Um, uh, human wonders, man-made wonders like Keanu Reeves' movies and the town of San Malo, <laughs> but a constant in your fiction, indeed your nonfiction also, uh, no matter where the stories are set, is the wonder and the study of the natural world. And reading your work reminded me of this great quotation from another, and I think this is, you know, you're in a, in a relatively small club of uh, writers who take their fiction and their science seriously. 
You have your shells as a kind of emblem on your books. Hmm. Nabokov had his butterflies, and he said a writer should have the precision of a poet and the imagination of a scientist. Huh. I love that. It's great. So I that resonates sure. with you? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, there's a writer who I admire very much uh, named Andrea Barrett, um, who really was kind of, uh, just her work gave me permission. Uh, she has a book called Ship Fever, that won the National Book Award. Uh, maybe some of you might know it's a beautiful novella inside that story collection called Ship Fever. She writes so beautifully about science, cares so deeply about it, and the fact that... Uh, I, as soon as I read her, I'm like, oh, you're allowed to do that? Like, you're allowed to use your curiosities from one other place and, you, and use it to tell stories? You know, I had been in love with Aldo Leopold and Annie Dillard and Edward Abbey and people who were writing about the environment in nonfiction, but I wasn't sure I was allowed to try to tell stories about it. Right. And, um, you know, I, I'm just so, so grateful. So that was a liberation for you? Too. I think yeah. so, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's an amazing educator here named John Long who runs the Post Oak School, uh, and, you know, I grew up with a mother who was a science teacher, a Montessori teacher, and maybe it's just that she never drew those lines. She never said, like, you have to choose between the arts building on campus and the science building on campus, you know? Um, and I went to a liberal arts college in Maine, so maybe that was part of it. But I was never uh, discouraged from following curiosities or told that, like, one precluded the other, necessarily. Like, it was okay to take physics on Monday and then on Tuesday take Shakespeare. That was all right at Bowdoin College where I went. And I think maybe that was part of my upbringing. And so the fact that I was allowed to pursue curiosities through writing, in a lot of ways, fiction writing is just an excuse for me to go try to educate myself to some small degree about whatever it is I'm really interested in, you know? And cool then try to share that excitement. Because the more you learn about anything, the more interesting it becomes. And then to try to share that enthusiasm with a reader. You know. I think it's in the Rome book that you say the real thrill is not knowing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, oh, yeah, he's, he's amazing, isn't he good? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, we're going to bring in some other voices here. Uh, we're going to change gears here a little bit. Um, there's that wonderful sentence that I know a lot of people have picked up on from the deep. To say no to Ruby Hornaday would be to say no to the world. And it seems that your fiction is so much about people saying yes to the world, sometimes having to learn slowly how to say yes to the world. Now we're going to say yes to some questions from the audience. So where are our microphones and our questioners? Our imprint colleagues should be out there getting this ready. And I believe, Tony, we're going to have a microphone on each side. Okay. And I think we have time for, would it be okay for about 10 minutes of questions? Whatever you guys are up and for. And then uh, we'll wrap it up. Good evening. Good evening. I fell in love with Winkler. And um, both of the books, of, all three books of yours that I've read, and I'm disappointed there aren't 20 to oh, yeah. delve into for the next 20 years. <laughs> but um, all three of those books were a lot about light and clouds and rain, as he said about nature. Tell us about your relationship with light. Sure. That's a nice question that I've never got before. Um, my brother went to MIT when he was 17 on a full ride, my oldest brother, and became an electrical engineer and studies optics. And uh, I don't, you know, he's the one who like gets invited around the world to talk about light. I'm the foolish uh, amateur, but I don't know, you know, we had prisms on our windows and I just always loved this idea that, um, you know, okay, let me make sure I get this right. The, the, the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that is visible light is uh, one ten trillionth of all the light that's available to us. And we can't see anything else. And it just, it's such a metaphor immediately in my mind to, for how limited all of our senses are. You know, we think of snakes, for example, or bees as, you know, inferior creatures lower in the animal kingdom. But snakes can see in the infrared. They can sense heat. Bees can see in the ultraviolet. And they can see patterns in uh, flower petals that we cannot see. And even little shrimp and coral reefs, they found this, the much wider chromatic scale in their eyes than ours, where they're actually seeing a wider range of color 
color and their brains are like the size of a poppy seed and you know they're seeing a richer environment in a lot of ways than we are I just think that you know the, all the technological ways we've tried to amplify our senses the way we can now you know, use Hubble to see into the past and the way we can use microscopes to find viruses all these things are just so fascinating to me and uh, so I don't know I think light represents this metaphor for, for all of our limitations and how we try to surpass them and fail to surpass them. Winkler in About Grace is diagnosed with, is it pathologic myopia? <laughs> right. Right. I, I, right. I, I, I sense that you were saying that's the human condition, perhaps. Right. Yeah. I, my problem is like, you know, even reading this, I want to change a bunch because, you know, I'm just cramming as many metaphors as I can. I'm like, and, and About Grace, I'm just like, every water metaphor and every vision metaphor I can, I'm just jamming. I have them work at lens crafters for crying out loud at the end of the novel. <laughs> Well, listen, th this is great. I think we will, everybody who's currently standing, uh, our four guests here, we'll, we'll take all these questions. We'll have time for that. So over to our right here and this gentleman. Uh, yeah, a quick question about the structure, which you mentioned, because I violated, thankfully, two of my rules, which is never read something more than 300 pages <laughs> and never read something with short chapters. Um, and so I, I want to ask you about that, because you mentioned, I was glad you described it as absurd to have 176 chapters. Um, and because usually my attention span is a chapter uh, right. and just to do it that way because I mean I was did many more chapters in an evening especially as time was rolling on but what was that like to come up with that structure yeah thanks for the question um, pretty early on in the design I realized that I'd have two characters running basically in parallel although maybe they're slightly inclined toward each other in terms of the structure and they would not intersect until very late in the narrative so if it was a 500 page book they were not going to meet until like page 480 something and I thought no reader is ever going to wait that long to see them walk out on stage together so I thought one way I can do that is just try to disrupt the chronology to suggest in the opening that they're quite close in proximity to each other, that they're only a couple hundred meters apart, and that then uh, hopefully a reader will anticipate their intersection a little bit more. And then uh, I developed this whole thing where uh, one of the characters, Mahri, her father, would be a puzzle builder. He's a, uh, he's a locksmith, but he also in his spare time builds little puzzles, little wooden puzzles and scale models. And so I started thinking, can I make the structure of the book kind of feel like a puzzle itself so that the reader herself is kind of wandering through these streets, feeling a little bit lost, but trying to figure out her way through time and place. Uh, so I wanted to try to also have the structure mimic that part of the story. And finally, maybe this seems a little flip, but um, my kids are 11, and I uh, started the book 11 years ago. And uh, I was just learning how to become a parent uh, while writing this book before I mean you don't even realize when you're trying to be a writer before you have kids <laughs> you can spend all day doing whatever you want pretty much <laughs> it's kind of incredible you know and I have no idea how inefficient I was I'd be like now I will walk very slowly to pour tea and you know after you have kids you're like there's tea all over you and you haven't eaten in a, three days it doesn't matter so I would, at my time, especially because I was teaching now and then, I would have pretty truncated periods of time in which to construct uh, chapters. So sometimes if I could only find two hours or I was sitting there at a swim lesson while they're like half drowning in the pool, <laughs> I would just work through uh, short things. And somehow, you know, I would feel a little bit of accomplishment or le I'd feel less hateful of myself if I got through one piece of writing and made it slightly stronger you know just we talked about this a little bit earlier today but just trying to remove some passenger words that are just along for the ride or just trying to get you know the uh, the great writer he's somewhere from somewhere in Texas Lawrence Wright I love his nonfiction he calls it literary liposuction you know it's like just <laughs> sucking the cholesterol out of the sentences you know if that's all I, I had they time do that for. in the medical center here in <laughs> oh, <a> yeah. lucrative <laughs> business let's go back over to the left here we've got three more questions <clears throat> Just a question about your, your structure, maybe your style. Uh, when you start something like maybe your short stories more than your novel, do you know where you're going? Do you really know where you're going or do you just kind of let it, let it develop as you're writing? Yeah, great question. And I think it's a, a good question, especially for those of you who are just getting started of whatever age and trying to write stories, write plays, write screenplays. Um, 
No. I, if somebody had told me that when I was 20 and trying to get going, I think I would have felt a lot better. I thought, oh, you know, Virginia Woolf knew everything that was going to happen, and then she just kind of channeled it down. But uh, there may be writers like that. There's the stories about John Irving that supposedly he can kind of spend a year dreaming out everything that will happen in a novel. He's got that skeleton, and then he'll put flesh on the skeleton next the following year. In my case, um, I, I really like the surprise of not really knowing what a certain character will do, even during that day. It means there's a lot more dead ends, and you have to be a little bit more ruthless with getting rid of pages that took you a lot of time to write. Um, if, if there are, I think it's 176 chapters in All the Light, there were probably at one point, you know, 200 and plus, 250 maybe. And, you, you know, you, you write, I, I wrote a long, a lot about um, Monsieur Levite, the perfumer, Claude, big Claude, they called him. Uh, I was trying to, I was reading a lot about collaboration in France, and so I had written a lot of chapters from his point of view. I didn't realize until much later that maybe he was a kind of much more peripheral character, and then my editor's helping point some of that stuff out to me. Um, so, uh, no, you never know. Sometimes you have an end point. I, uh, I knew something would happen to Werner towards the end of the book. I don't want to spoil that for anybody, but um, I knew that was hap would happen, and so I'm kind of writing sometimes maybe this invisible bridge toward a, an end point that you know is there. So sometimes you're building connective tissue and you have somewhere to build it toward, but you still don't quite know. It's really fumbling in, through the dark and going by instinct, then sleeping, waking up and reading through what you've got, trying to understand what it is, hopefully paring away the weaker stuff and holding on to the little thread that might be strong enough to hold on to. All the chapters we cannot read. Okay. <laughs> Or that we don't want to read. Yeah. Back over to our right here for our penultimate question. Right. So I came to know your work through the stories and a lot of the imagery that stays with me, Dorothea and her fishing rod, you know, a perfectly peeled orange rind in a circle. A lot of those images are so wonderfully emotional and free of things like irony and sarcasm and a certain world weariness. And the thing that occurs to me is that I wonder, it, it seems to me that in certain parts of the literary landscape, that kind of allegiance to the human heart feels very risky. And I wonder if at any point when you were learning, still trying to figure out what you do, did you ever kind of wrestle with that? Were you ever walking a line? Did you ever experiment with things like irony and sarcasm? I mean, I, to me, your writing shows me that the human heart is the perfect place to be, and I love that about you, but I just kind of want, it just, it feels like it might um, seem risky, given the literary landscape, and I'm wondering kind of how you feel about that, or if you ever yeah, wrestle with such an amazing question, Julia, amazing. Um, I, I was struggling with it up there while I was reading that story. I'm like, I'm cramming way too many heart metaphors in here. Uh, you know, it's young love. Uh, I've put this insane pressure on this character of mortality that's on all of us, but I made it so literal that it's almost obnoxious. Um, you know, uh, oh my gosh, that's all, all I worry about. However, you can't let fear stop you from doing the things you're interested in. I like reading masters of irony, um, especially ones with soul, like George Saunders or something, or Mark Twain. Um, uh, cynical work is not as interesting to me, although there are some artists who are cynical as people and still make really, really beautiful work. <laughs> um, I just, I've always kind of had this naivete. I, I'm worried, my biggest fear this past year or two is that my readership has increased a lot, which is what every writer wants, but I am spending more time talking and less time like alone, like playing with bugs with my children in the grass, which is really the things that I think fill my soul with that kind of sense of wonder. Um, and there's also the destruction of our Earth happening all around us. There's this thing called the shifting baseline syndrome where, you know, we think of, you know, wilderness as what we saw as children. And so I never really felt it emotionally until I hit my late 30s and 40s when, like, I'm out for a bike ride and suddenly there's a housing development on the trail where I was going for a bike ride eight years before. Or, you know, I go back home to Cleveland and see some things that, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, there's, uh, you know, there's so much growth here. I'm sure you guys see in Houston beyond belief. Uh, you know, Rich was telling me there was the, the one of the first industries here was forestry. 
I'm like, whoa, I don't see. I mean, see how some gorgeous. <laughs> there's some gorgeous live oaks here, don't get me wrong. Unbelievable live oaks. But, you know, you, you start thinking, you know, what, what kind of landscape are my children coming into? So for me, that's the biggest danger is the cynicism about our treatment of the environment. The way I am still, like, I have plastic right here, and my grandkids will, pro they should be super mad at me about this. They'd be like, you could have brought your metal water bottle, and you could have ridden your bike to Texas instead of flown on an airplane. <laughs> Grandpa, you know, uh, so to try to guard that, especially now, you know, when, you know, when you hear, uh, I don't want to get in trouble, but when you hear, you know, Ted Cruz or Trump or some of the things coming out of their mouths on television and you think, you know, okay, turn that off because I can, I just felt one more needle go into my bubble of anti-cynicism, you know, uh, so I, I think you just kind of have to guard that and uh, at least from, in, in my case, I have to protect that for my work, I think. I'm trying to. Having kids really, really helps with that. I'm not advising that if some of you are on the fence about it. <laughs> but they show me the world in a new way. Children are remaking the world all the time. Just go to a park with a five-year-old and pay attention to what they're paying attention to. And suddenly the world becomes new again. You know, a leaf becomes super interesting. Drawing is another thing, you know, you see people, when, they, when you really sit down and draw without a phone nearby, you really start paying attention to the world around you. Journaling is another thing you can do, just looking at things. Uh, it helps you slow down and start seeing all these wonders around you, even if you're right outside a landfill. There's still amazing things to see. Excellent. And finally, our Thank guest has been waiting very patiently here. The final question of the evening. Hi, Tony. Sarah yes. Haberman here oh, from my uh, gosh. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> so We haven't seen uh, each other in probably over 20 years, but yeah. since we're both alums of Montessori, I wanted to ask you if you think your fascination with water has anything to do with the timelines we studied that really emphasize that that is where life began. And um, perhaps that contributes to some of the lack of cynicism and the joy uh, that we've just been talking about. Yeah, that's so sweet, Sarah. That's so great to see you. Um, yeah, so uh, I actually wrote the, a little essay about this for, of all things, Chipotle. It's like this ridiculous fast food place. And they asked writers to write things for their cups, which I thought was kind of an interesting idea, so that things would be on their cups, and it's some incredibly short length, like 300 words. But I had been thinking about um, the timelines that we studied in Montessori. Like, I could spell... Cambrian before I could spell Coca-Cola, really. And um, one of them was my mom did was with a toilet paper roll where you t roll a toilet paper, uh, you know, if it's dry, you can do it outside and through a parking lot or something. And that represents the age, the 4.5 billion year age of the earth. And uh, she would have us mark out when certain forms of life arrived. And, you know, it's amazing when you see it visually, you know, there's no, I'm going to get all these numbers wrong without a notebook in front of me, but, you know, there's no life for over half of the entire paper towel roll or toilet paper roll. And then as you get towards the end, you know, you think, oh, well, dinosaurs must appear now and dinosaurs must appear now, but they don't even appear until way well into the final square of the toilet paper roll. <laughs> and all of human, all of human history, in prehistory, but you know, Greece and Egypt, which you think of as impossibly old as a kid, uh, you know, all of that stuff fixed really into this microscopic sliver at the end of the toilet paper roll, you know, on your grandma, who you think of as super old, and all of her <laughs> weird recipes, they all just fit in this tiny, tiny microscopic sliver at the end, uh, and that was such a lesson to me as a kid, you know, it's you would think it's humbling or st scary, and maybe it is, but it's also so um, uplifting you, to, be, to be born, to have the chance that one of you, all of your father's sperm, one of his gross, like, 200 million sperm found its way into this egg, and that meant you. And then that, that egg attached is so incredibly uh, lucky, and that your mother fed herself well enough to have you. And that she fed you well enough that you were alive at a time when kids lived past five, which is only recently. Uh, and that you, you got to be alive at this moment. And I don't believe in reincarnation. I think you have one trip, you know, 80 years if you're so, so blessed. So why not learn as much as you can and feel yourself inside those larger scales of time? And it helps you feel both small and huge and powerful all at once, I think.
So after that review of uh, human history, we end, of course, with a reference to lens crafters. <laughs> Do you remember the ophthalmologist, Dr. Evans? She's David Winkler's wow. boss in yes, About Grace. And she tells David, she says, what we do is important, David. What we do is help people see. So we like to say to you, Anthony Doerr, what you do is important. What you do is help people like us see. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank you, guys. That's so Have a great signing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.